Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for Sunday, January 10th, 2021. We are in our second lesson of Unit 2. Actually, it's Lesson 6 for the quarter, uh, which is entitled, Unit 2 is entitled, Jesus and Calls in His Ministry. Jesus and Calls in His Ministry. From the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly, our lesson title is The Ultimate Fish Story. Devotional reading is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, verses 57 to 62. Our background scripture, which is the same as our printed or lesson text, is Luke, chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Our key verse is verse 10, and from the KJV, it reads, Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. The lesson aims from the quarterly, or number one, contemplate the story of the miraculous catch of fish. Number two, reflect on Simon's changing attitude toward Jesus as the story progresses. And number three, hear Jesus' instructions and eagerly obey them. The lesson has three divisions after the introduction. The first is entitled, Call to See. And that's covered between Luke chapter 5, verses 1 and 3. The second division is entitled, Call to Search. And that's covered between chapter 5, verses 4 and 7. And then the, the third and final division is entitled, Call to Significance. That's covered between chapter 5, verses 8 and 11. From the Standard Commentary, our lesson title is Call to Follow. Call to Follow. Additional aims are, number one, recite the plot twist in Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Number two, explain the nature of Jesus' calling of the fishermen. And number three, write a statement that rephrases his or her job in terms of Jesus' call to evangelism. Uh, this lesson has four major divisions, and um, we'll just briefly mention those. The first is a swallow uh, dash water teaching. I'm sorry, <laughs> sorry, shallow, shallow water teaching. That's covered between verses one and three. The second is deep water miracle, covered between verses four and seven. The third is Simon's epiphany, covered between verses eight and 10a. And the final is Jesus' call. That's covered between 10b and 11. Uh, we are going to um, give a little background on the, the, the lesson, uh, the setting. Uh, have a, a brief word of prayer. And then we're going to get into a verse by verse uh, discussion of the lesson. Um, <clears throat> Jesus has... Uh, been, as we read last week, in his hometown of Nazareth, where he was not respected. You remember the reading from Isaiah, uh, where he said, this, uh, this day is this prophecy fulfilled, uh, and uh, he was, uh, they wanted to throw him off the brow of the city. Well, he's moved down to Capernaum, which is uh, along the northwest shore of the Lake of Gennesaret or Sea of Gennesaret, which is really the Sea of Galilee. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, he has performed many miracles, uh, and the people uh, have been flocking to him. In fact, if we back up to verse 40 of chapter 4, I'm sorry, let's back all the way up to 38, we see how Jesus uh, had been teaching in the synagogue, and after he finished, he goes to Simon's house. This is the same Simon that we're going to be uh, uh, reading about in our lesson text. And 
uh, the one that he would name Peter later on, or Cephas. And Simon's wife's mother was sick. Uh, she had a high fever, and Jesus miraculously healed her, and she arose immediately after that healing and served them. And then uh, they brought everyone around in the town, uh, brought sick folk to him as the, as it began to uh, the sun began to set, and he healed all of the diseases. Uh, and then the next morning, the people follow him. If we go uh, back to uh, 42, it says, Now when it was day, he departed and went into a deserted place. And the crowd sought him and came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, because for this purpose I have been sent. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Galilee. Now, Capernaum, uh, like Nazareth, were, were towns or cities, if you will, small cities in uh, Galilee. Now, uh, our lesson text begins uh, with the next verse. That's chapter 5, verse 1. Uh, the multitude, again, don't want him to leave. They're following him. He's gone to a deserted place, but they followed him uh, because, uh, initially, because of the healing, but Jesus is also teaching. He's teaching in the synagogues, and they recognize him to be a man of God by virtue of the validation uh, that uh, of the, the miracles that he's performing. So with that as a little background, let's let and Jesus is just beginning his 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 three year, uh, three plus year uh, public ministry, and he is uh, in the process of calling his disciples. We'll see uh, in a minute how he uh, calls some of them, uh, uh, some of the twelve that would become apostles. Father, we do thank and praise you for yet another opportunity to study, uh, to understand, and to heed your precious word, Lord. We thank you for the examples of this word, Lord. We, we ask that uh, you'd help us, Lord, to not only uh, hear, but to obey, Lord, your word uh, as we understand it. Increase our faith. Lord, we, we know that you know all about what's going on in our world today, and we, we pray that you'd help us to remember always that you are always in control. Uh, you told us in your word that evil men will wax worse and worse. There will be uh, times of trial and tribulation. But you said, but be of good cheer. You've overcome the world. You said, in this world we will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. You have overcome the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. We pray for you to increase our faith, Lord. Help us to be uh, the calm in the midst of the storm. We know that uh, many have suffered as a result of this pandemic, and we know that that is in your control, too. We pray for their relief. We pray for the healing for those who contracted it. We pray for comfort for those who lost loved ones to it, Lord. We pray that you would bring peace to our nation, Lord, that you would bring that let your redeemed say so, Lord. Speak out for righteousness and speak out for peace. Speak out for justice, Lord. No adjective before, just justice, Lord, what is right in your sight. And we thank you, Lord, again for um, those who tuned in uh, to listen to this lesson. We pray that, again, they would understand that their faith would be increased and they would be obedient to your word and, and the examples of this particular narrative. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so we uh, are going to uh, begin uh, with the first passage from the quarterly. Uh, and I'm, well, I'll read it from the King James Version. I may uh, be going back and forth between uh, it, the King James Version, and the NIV. I like uh, the uh, the old Oxford English uh I know that sometimes it can be uh, more difficult to understand than, of course, our, the plain English of the NIV, so I go back and forth. But verse 1 says, uh, beginning at verse 1, And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, 
he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships or boats there. They were standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him to that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught people out of the ship. Now, uh, again, we pick up in chapter 5, where we left off at the end of chapter 4. The people have tracked him down uh, because of the, the healing, the miracles, and also because they want to hear the word of God. Uh, now, it's, it's, it's unclear as to exactly what is meant by that phrase, hear the word of God. Uh, it can mean to hear about God from Jesus, or it can mean to, uh, to hear God's instructions or God's uh, commandments, God's will for his people, or that is the word that comes from God. But either way, uh, they want to hear from Jesus and they no doubt um, believe him to be a prophet, a spokesman for the Lord. But let's back up a little bit and look at this setting. Um, so Jesus has gone to this deserted place and, and it looks like it's along the shore of the lake of Gennesaret. Uh, and uh, they are pressing him. The crowd is pressing him so much so and there, you can imagine they've kind of encircled him. And he really can't uh, uh, speak to them in that in that situation. So uh, we're going to see what he is going to do. Now, this Lake Gennesaret is um, called, called a number of things in the New Testament, including uh, the Sea of Galilee. It's actually a lake. It's a uh, like about 15 miles long and about seven miles, I'm sorry, 13 miles long and seven miles wide. Uh, and uh, much of Jesus's ministry was done uh, close to this lake uh, called the Sea again of Galilee. It's called the Sea of Tiberias. Uh, we see that in John chapter six, verse one and, chap and chapter 21, one. In the Old Testament, it was called the Sea of uh, Chinneroth. Chinneroth in, jo in, in Joshua chapter 12, we see that in verse 3. But it is this uh, more commonly known as the Sea of Galilee or Lake of Galilee. And uh, that is where uh, Jesus resorts to or goes to. Verse 2 says, And saw two ships standing by the lake. But the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And the NIV is more correct in calling them uh, boats. Uh, they were actually uh, two boats uh, that were approximately 27 feet long, 7 feet wide, about 4 feet deep. It was, those were common first century fishing boats. They held about 15 passengers or five crew members and a catch of fish. And uh, so uh, Jesus goes and sees the boats. Fishermen are not there. Uh, they typically will wash their nets along the shore because when they, when they drag the nets, they pick up all kinds of things, as you can imagine, in the lake, and all kinds of trash and what have you. So they have to clean their nets after every uh, outing, after every fishing uh, excursion. Uh, verse 3a, And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. Um, NIV reads, He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. 
uh, I actually read part B of three as well. Now, um, now this Simon is the one that Jesus renames Peter. Uh, we know John refers to him as uh, Simon Peter. Uh, he also refers to him as Cephas, which means a stone. But this is the one, uh, Andrew's brother, that Jesus named Peter, which we know means a rock. Uh, and uh, I, Jesus no doubt thought that that suited his character. Uh, and this is uh, not Simon's first meeting uh, with Jesus, or of Jesus, or, um, his first meeting of Jesus. Uh, he uh, actually, as I, as we said during the uh, the background discussion, uh, has been in Simon's house. Uh, he has uh, healed his mother-in-law, and of course, um, so this this is part of probably a number of one of a number of occasions over a few days that Jesus uh, encountered Simon and John and, and James, for that matter. And that's important for us to understand because uh, Simon knows that uh, Jesus is a, a miracle worker and believes him to be a prophet. Okay, when, he, when we're going to, this is going to uh, be more important uh, when we get down uh, the lesson, down a few verses into the lesson. All right, now, uh, so he sat in the boat, part B of three says, and he taught the people. That was the customary posture of a prophet or a, a, a uh, teacher, if you will, in the synagogue. It was to stand up and read and then to sit and to teach. And um, uh, no doubt he had a, uh, a much better vantage where he could be seen. And he could see uh, the people. He can be heard better. Uh, you know, water uh, carries voices uh, very well. In fact, uh, it, it kind of amplifies them. So uh, he didn't need to speak very loudly, most likely for to be heard at some distance and by the entire crowd. And we don't. And, and he is teaching uh, the word of God. He's speaking the words of God, and uh, they are no doubt delighted to hear them and he's speaking as one with authority which we read elsewhere in the gospels not as the typical scribe so now we move into the second division of uh, the quarterly which is entitled call to search we just completed call to see uh, and the people are seeing and the people are hearing from Jesus. Now, this is called to search. Again, from the King James Version, beginning at verse 4. We're going to cover verses 4 to 7. Now, when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draw or a catch. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word I will let down the net and when they had done this uh, when they had this done rather they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break verse 7 and they beckoned unto their partners which were in the other ship that they should come and help them and they came and filled both ships or boats so that they began to sink. Now, um, it was not uncommon, we find out later in Jesus' public ministry, for him to combine miracles with teaching. Uh, and I'm convinced that that was done to authenticate his authority uh, and the truth of what he was speaking to authenticate his uh, authority uh, as a uh, as a as a prophet, uh, and to verify, if you will, or validate the tr his words, the truth of his words. So um, he launches. He he tells they're in shallow water. They're close to the shore. When he finishes speaking, he asks Peter, "Okay, let's move out into the deep water." 
And Peter, being an experienced fisherman, probably fished uh, commercially for many years, you know, initially complains. He said, hey, we, we, that's why we were cleaning our nets. You know, we, we, we tried all night and we caught nothing but, but, but trash and junk. We were cleaning out of our nets. But, but he said, but at your word or because of, because you're the one asking I will go back out and we and drop the net and lower the net. Okay, that's what he that's what he he means. And when he refers to him as master, he is recognizing him uh, as a a teacher. Okay, because he he is he's heard him. He's been right there hearing him teach uh, teach the words of God. So when they get out to the deep water, they lower the net. And that was customary. They fisher, fishermen, commercial fishermen, used a drag net, or they used a a large circular net uh, to catch fish. And uh, they would drag the net behind the the boat, and it would catch not only fish, but as I said, other things as well, whatever was in its path. And they caught probably the most fish they ever had. So much so, the net began to break and so they they beckoned the other boat remember there were two boats on the shore and maybe the, the second one was still on the shore and they say hey come out here we need some help uh that was john and james uh and they came out and and uh both well we'll see here in just a minute uh that both uh boats were filled to the point of sinking. Uh, and this says something about uh, the way in which God wants to bless uh, us. And I'm not, please don't misunderstand me. I'm, I'm not teaching or pre- health and wealth, but uh, Jesus didn't ask them to come out there to, uh, to catch a, uh, a piddly few fish. Uh, he showed them the real power of God, and uh, and uh, a real miraculous something that was 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 clearly understood as a miracle to these experienced fishermen. These fishermen had been fishing for years, and they knew about what they could expect to get out of that lake. Okay, uh, these boats were filled to the point of sinking, and no doubt that was that was the largest catch any of those fishermen had ever seen in their lives. And uh, so they, they are able to get back to the shore, we know, uh, without sinking, with this abundance of fish. Now the, uh, the quarterly commentator makes a, an interesting statement. He says, Jesus' command includes a hint of expectation. Those who expect a great catch do not remain in shallow water. And I think we understand what that means. If we expect to see great things uh, done by God and great things done by God through us, it means we have to go out into the deep water. We have to be able to, uh, willing rather, uh, to make sacrifices for God, to surrender all to God to follow him completely. Uh, that's what going out into the deep means, at least at, at, to me. And uh, we need to, uh, when Jesus, when, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Simon said, at thy word, it means because, because he says so. When Jesus commands us to do something, and it does, you know, this is something that uh, uh, can be, uh, uh, he can, he can tell us by the Spirit, confirmed by His Word, or simply in His Word. Okay, uh, we don't have to have any ec- ecstatic experience, but we are to do what He commands us to do. One of the things He's commanded us to do clearly is to love one another, uh, as He's loved us. And by this, He said, "All men will know that you are My disciples." He's commanded us to forgive one another. He's commanded us to do a number of things that he expects us to do uh, with, uh, uh, with, without hesitation, 
okay, and continuously. He's told us to, to, to evangelize. He's told us to take his word to the world. So let's go on now. Let's move into the third division, uh, which is entitled Call to Significance. And that's covered between verses 8 and 11. That's covered between verses 8 and 11 again. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him, at the drought or the catch of the fish which they had taken. Verse 10, And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. Verse 11, And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. All right, let's back up to 8. And let's look at 8b. Um, it says, this is Simon now. He fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. I'm sorry. <laughs> I read B before A. 8a says, When Simon Peter saw it, he saw this miracle. Again, he had uh, no doubt witnessed some of the miracles of healing the night before and knew that Jesus was capable of, or God through Jesus, uh, was performing miracles. But this was right down his, his bailiwick, if you will. It was right down his alley. He knew something about fishing. And he knew this was a miraculous catch. And, and he was astonished by it. He says, uh, in, in part B again, he fell down at Jesus' knees and in a, in a, in a, a worshipful attitude or posture, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Now, uh, both commentators seem to, to say that this is really the, the perfect reaction to uh, a miracle of God. But, but also, I think, to the recognition of God in our presence. Now, we don't know that, I don't believe even, that Peter recognized Jesus as the Messiah at that point. We know that he does, and he confesses that in Matthew chapter 16, that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. But at this point, early in Jesus' public ministry, he knows that he is a holy man. He knows that he is a man of God. He knows that God is with him and working through him. And it is that holiness of God that he sees in Jesus that, that uh, magnifies his sinfulness. You know, in the presence of holiness, we, we, the, we can't help but recognize our sinfulness, how far short of that holiness we fall. You know, when I, when I first uh, began to study the Bible seriously, in fact, when I first went through it, uh, through it the first time, my eyes were opened as to how wretched I was for the first time. Because before that time, I thought, "Hey, I'm, I'm okay. I don't rob. I don't steal. I don't, you know, I don't do this murder and all of that. So I'm, I'm all right. I give a few dollars to beggars on the corner every now and then. But, but when I looked into God's word, His word looked into me, and I saw the wretchedness. I saw myself as God saw me, and I in counter distinction to his holiness and that's what that's what happens uh, in the presence of holiness uh, and so this was a natural reaction to first of all fall down and worship again i'm not again i'm not sure that he recognized at that point that he was worshiping god incarnate but or he was uh it was a gesture of of respect and awe, and but also, uh, again, uh, a, 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 an admission 
of his, and a recognition, if you will, of his sinfulness in contrast to this holiness that he was witnessing. And he asked Jesus to depart from him because of that. You know, he, he doesn't want to feel uh, more sinful uh, uh, than he uh, ordinarily did in the presence of this holiness. And, and we've had, um, you know, we, we do evangelism here and there, and we, um, we, uh, we work through a prison ministry. And, and one of the things that we, we recognize uh, f- uh, uh, is, is necessary uh, to evangelize, to share the gospel with someone uh, who is, um, is serious, is a serious seeker, if you will, is that they have to recognize their sinfulness. They have to recognize their need of a savior before they will ever accept one. If they don't think that they're sinful, they don't think that they're that bad, uh, that uh, they, they they're mar- that they can uh, earn uh, salve- or, or heaven, if you will, uh, by merit, then they're never going to accept Christ. They're never going to accept the sacrifice that he made for their sin because they're not going to think that they're that bad. Like the scribes and the Pharisees who were self-righteous, who thought they were holy and didn't need a savior and therefore did not recognize the one in their very presence. Let's look at verse 9 and 10a. For he was astonished and all that were with him at the draught or the catch of fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. So they were close by, obviously. they This was the largest catch they had ever seen, James and John, or, and they were no doubt very experienced fishermen as well in partnership with Peter and I'm sure his brother Andrew. Uh, and, and this word astonished means simply that amazed. These, again, were experienced fishers, fishermen and they knew what they could expect and on a good day, on a very good day, having fished this lake for many years. Uh, and, and, and we know that uh, Jesus is going to call all of them uh, to be his disciples and ultimately uh, be among the 12 that become his apostles. And, and I don't want to uh, confuse things. We know that uh, you can get a bit confused reading the different gospel uh, passages concerning Jesus' calling of the 12. Uh, and I have a, a Bible that actually harmonizes the gospel that make, makes that a little more easy to understand. But uh, it appears that these men were called uh, over uh, some days at least, that Jesus, this is not Jesus' uh, first meeting of uh, James and John, or and maybe it is, but we know ultimately he calls them out of their father's boat, out of Zebedee's, I mean, out of their boat. They're, they're mending their nets and what have you, and, he, and they leave and they follow him. Uh, we know also uh, that uh, Andrew uh, is the one that, told his brother Peter about Christ. So we, we know that there were, uh, we're only seeing, um, if you will, scenes, snapshots uh, in uh, the process that uh, Jesus called uh, his 12 disciples through. I should say, using. And Jesus said unto Simon, fear not. That's, that's, uh, D, part B and part C says, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. Now, Jesus recognizes that Simon and the others are in earshot. We have to believe that James and John are in earshot as well. It's fearful uh, because of uh, the, the, the awesomeness of the holiness of Christ. Uh, and, 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 you know, and, and as I said, when you recognize uh, your sinfulness uh, in the presence of holiness, uh, one of the things that should come to mind is your deserving of, of punishment because of your sin. 
And so um, no doubt that uh, notions of fear are running through uh, Simon and and Jesus calms him just like uh, the angel did uh, uh, with uh, Zacharias, the priest uh, who was uh, burning incense in the in the temple, and with Mary uh, at the announcement of the birth of Jesus. He's, when he, their, their appearance was startling. Uh, they were supernatural in appearance, and so he had to calm them. And also the angels that appeared to the uh, the shepherds in the field they, they were they were they, they were frightening, and the shepherds were fearful, so Jesus calms them in the same manner, and he tells them from now on you 're going to catch men you 're not going to catch fish to be killed and eaten, but you 're going to garner souls uh, for salvation for deliverance from the penalty of sin, from the power of sin, and ultimately from the very presence of sin. And, uh, and, and that is what he's called us to do as well, to be fishers of men, to be fishers. And by that, I mean men and women, boys and girls. I mean to be fishers of souls. Uh, to, and we do that uh, by the power of his spirit in teaching them very simply what he taught us about himself, his reason for coming, his sacrificial death on the cross for our sins, and about eternal the eternal life that he has purchased for us by his blood. So Jesus is, is simply calling Simon to participate in his mission of gathering people into the kingdom of God. And, uh, they're no longer going to need the tools of the fishermen, the boats, nets, uh, and so forth. Uh, they're going to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to do that, just as we are. And finally, verse 11 reads, And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. So they got the ships uh, to shore and there's a little, uh, I'm not sure if it said, when it says they followed him, if, if that was, if they followed him immediately, if they simply left the ships uh, with the fish for someone else to, uh, to take or sell. Uh, they may have had partners uh, who um, were able to market those fish to pay them their own salaries and uh, maybe uh, provide something for them as well uh, as the proprietors of the business. Uh, don't know, but we it, it it appears that they they left the business. It said they forsook all. It means they left the fishing business. Uh, no doubt, again to some others to take over, and they followed him. And and now let's think about that. Uh, that. That took a lot of faith, I mean, to just drop their livelihood. Obviously, it had some economic consequences. It had some uh, all kinds of consequences, uh, self-worth, uh, social standing, uh, social consequences. Uh, it, it, it had, um, uh, but, 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 but that wasn't, but the other, the, the, whatever it cost them, uh, they didn't concern themselves with the ramifications of forsaking uh, what they had known uh, all, most probably all of their lives. Uh, and uh, they entered into this relationship with Christ uh, out of faith, out of faith what uh, God was doing in him and through him and would ultimately do through them. Uh, and so, so again, at his word, they followed him. He, we know that Again, if you read other Gospels, Jesus actually calls them. We read about when Jesus prayed all night uh, about, the, about the, those that he would call to be the apostles. And he actually calls them. So again, there was a process uh, that happened here. Uh, and uh, and I, I imagine it was over some days that he, met, he meets and has interaction with and ultimately calls the 12 disciples that would be his followers. And let's not misunderstand 
Jesus had hundreds, perhaps thousands of disciples, followers throughout his public ministry, but only 12 of those disciples became apostles. So some, we often uh, confuse uh, the 12, we, we, we refer to the 12 disciples when we mean apostles because Jesus had many disciples, many followers, uh, and many learners uh, of uh, God through him, but he only had the 12 apostles. Now, in, in, in conclusion, I think our lesson challenges us to think about whether or not we have uh, given all that God requires of us to follow him. If we're following him wholeheartedly, this doesn't mean that we have to leave our, our professions. Uh, it doesn't mean that we have to become missionaries. But whatever God has called us to do uh, from wherever he's called us, have we uh, let go of whatever he's required us to uh, and followed him wholeheartedly? Uh, that's what he wants us to do. And I, and I would challenge you to ask yourself honestly if you have surrendered whatever God has called you to surrender and you have followed him with the intent of being obedient to him in your Christian walk. And, and, part, and, and, and that obedience not only means to live holy lives, okay, to live uh, being empowered by the enablement of his spirit. You know, he said, walk in the spirit or by the enablement of the spirit and we will not obey or be controlled by the lust of our flesh. And so he wants us to live holy lives, but, it, but he doesn't want us to, to just sit around looking or trying to be holy. He wants us to be telling others about him, about the salvation that God has provided through his sacrifice for the sins of the world. And I think um, that's something that uh, many of us neglect doing. Uh, when God gives you opportunity to open your mouth and speak about him and for him and what he is uh, and the greatest gift he's given the world, we ought to do it. So I, I hope and pray uh, that we've understood the lesson a little better than we may have before. This is a familiar passage. Uh, we know that... Uh, this is not the first time, the last time, I should say, that Jesus is going to perform a miracle involving uh, catching an abundance of fish. We can go to John chapter 21, and this is after Jesus' resurrection, after Peter has denied Jesus three times and really needs to be restored to what he has been called to at this, during, in, in the passage we just read, uh, when Jesus, uh, uh, they see Jesus uh, from the shore, or on the shore rather, they've been out. When Peter says, hey, I'm going fishing, you know, as, as if they've forgotten their calling. And they go out and they toil all night and they don't catch anything. And so they see the next morning, they see uh, what appears to be Jesus on the shore. And John said, it's the master. And, and we know that Peter jumps overboard and swims to shore but after this is after Jesus tells them to drop their net on the left side. And then they, they pull this multitude of fish out so much so the nets begin to break again. And Jesus certainly uh, ends his earthly ministry with the same demonstration, the same miracle uh, that he begins his ministry with, with these apostles or disciples that will become apostles. And Jesus uh, tells uh, Peter to feed his lamb, feed his sheep, feed his lamb, and then ultimately to follow him. And that's, uh, so it comes full circle after Jesus' resurrection, his involvement with Peter and, and, and his calling. And he had to remind him of that calling. He had to restore him to, uh, to, to fellowship with him and the calling, what he had called him to after Peter had denied him three times. So we pray again that we have understood the lesson uh, and we pray that you would uh, uh, take, uh, use uh, the examples provided in the lesson and the challenge uh, to uh, challenge ourselves as to whether we have surrendered all 
and whether we are truly following all that God would have us to do, all that the Lord Jesus would have us to do. So until next time, we pray that God would ever keep you in his care.